good evening or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. On behalf of Moray House Trust, welcome to this evening's panel entitled Building Consensus National Development Plan for Guyana. A warm welcome to our regulars. For any newcomers, Moray House Trust is a private, non-partisan, non-profit based in Georgetown and dedicated to promoting Guyanese culture and public discourse. My name is Isabel de Carries and I'm the Chair of Trustees. I propose to offer an outline of the format for this evening's event, to say a few words about the ethos of our panel events, and then to leave you in the capable hands of Stuart Hughes, President of the Guyana Association of Professional Engineers, who will moderate the session. Regrettably, one of our panelists, Dr. Anna Pereira, has taken ill and had to withdraw at short notice. We extend our condolences and wish her a swift recovery. In terms of the format, we start with a few words from the moderator and a presentation from each panelist. There's a, an interlude where the members of the panel can uh, ask each other questions uh, and have um, a discussion. And then there's an opportunity for the audience to ask questions, but please do try to keep the questions fairly brief. In a few weeks, Moray House Trust will mark 10 years of service. In that time, we have hosted dozens of panels on topics ranging from constitutional reform to the sugar industry, the petroleum industry and the environment. The aim is always the same, to offer the audience a broad spectrum of views and to encourage debate and discussion. Our speakers don't have all the answers. They start a dialogue that helps the public sphere to mature, to reaccustom itself to intelligent questioning. If it is to succeed, the, the process requires a willingness to engage, particularly on the part of those who hold public office. Thus far, there has been little evidence of this. And our work now spans three administrations. Once again, we reached out to two ministries seeking their representation on this panel. Once again, Despite multiple and repeated approaches, we have drawn a blank. It is understandable that with competing demands and busy schedules, ministers or agency heads may be unable to participate. It beggars belief that no one in the ministry can serve by way of a substitute. It seems to suggest either an unwillingness to engage or a disdain for these activities. Whatever the case, we will continue both to issue the invitation and to nurture the conversations. And now, without further delay, I'd like to hand you over to Stuart, tonight's moderator. Thank you. Thanks, Isabel. And firstly, congratulations to Moray House on your 10th anniversary. It seems just a short while ago that the trust was uh, launched. So um, I, I've attended many, many interesting sessions at, at uh, Moray House. So yeah, and can, uh, on behalf of KFL, I'd just like to congratulate the thru, uh, trust. Okay, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and good night for our colleagues joining from the UK and Europe. Uh, thank you for taking uh, some time out from your Saturday afternoons and evenings to, to join us for what hopefully uh, will be an interesting discussion. The subject of development planning has become quite topical given the country's newfound oil wealth and national revenues we are receiving from the new industry. I think the National Resources Fund now stands at over half a billion US dollars and is growing with every lift. So the need to ensure that we as a country benefit from our oil and gas industry in an equitable, inclusive and sustainable manner has in many ways never been quite as urgent as it is today. At the same time, in the face of this fortune, 
If our response is not carefully planned and managed, we potentially face an existential threat to our economy and a way of life as a result of the impact of climate change. However, while we face, sorry, while we face this challenge, my computer back to sorry. However, while we face this threat, we also stand to benefit economically and in an environmentally sustainable manner from the increasing global recognition of Guyana's ecosystem services given the incredible biodiversity and forest cover we have. The government of Guyana, cognizant of these challenges, has recently published the first draft of the Low Carbon Development Strategy, the LCDS 2030, uh, as a basis for national consultation on how we can redouble our efforts to build a low carbon economy in Guyana. The question we face, however, is how can we ensure the LCDS 2030 is fit for purpose? What basic elements constitute a national development plan? What can we as civil society and citizens do to ensure the LCDS 2030 is a truly collaborative cross-party consensus-based plan for sustainable and equitable development? To help us discuss these issues and hopefully answer some of the questions uh, is an interesting and more than capable panel of both new and old faces. And I hope none of our panelists <laughs> takes offense at this, as I say it in the context of their activism in civil society. But before we start, though, let me just say that the Guyana Association of Professional Engineers is very pleased to be associated with Mori House Trust this evening's panel discussion. At GAPE, we are particularly interested in the strategic infrastructure that will flow from a national development plan and ensuring that it's properly conceptualized, prioritized, and implemented in the most efficient and effective manner so as to benefit all Guyanese in the shortest possible time. And in fact, we hope to specifically address the issues of a national infrastructure plan uh, at a future, uh, future panel discussion. Okay, but back to tonight's event. Um, our first panelist is uh, none other than Dr. Colin Constantine. Uh, Colin is a lecturer and official fellow in economics at Girton College, University of Cambridge. His research, teaching and advising are in the fields of macroeconomics and political economy. A rather terse and brief definition for a gentleman whose career is, is on, a, on a sort of stellar path, uh, but it's by his uh, own request. Our second panelist is, is none other than uh, Mr. Lance Hines, whom I think we're all uh, somewhat familiar with. Lance is the chief executive of the Brain Street Group and is an ICT strategist with close to 30 years experience in the development and implementation of technology solutions in Guyana and the region. His current project, Dream Space, seeks to harness innovative concepts and transform from thoughts to solutions for community advancement. And hopefully Lance will give us a bit of a background on that. Uh, as Isabel mentioned, um, Dr. Anna Pereira unfortunately can't join us. I'll just quickly run through her credentials though. I mean, uh, Dr. Pereira is head of the Ar uh, architectural department at the University of Guyana and coordinator of the Green Institute. She's a lecturer and practitioner whose interests include green architecture and sustainable design, new urbanism, community economic development and knowledge management and construction nonprofit organization. And even though Anna isn't uh, able to join us this evening, hopefully we'll still be able to discuss um, some key themes around green infrastructure and um, climate resilience and uh, resilient uh, infrastructure. So uh, without further ado, I'd just like to ask Colin if he could um, kick things off uh, with his presentation this evening. Colin? Sure. Can you hear me, Stuart? Absolutely. Can you see my screen? We can. Great. Let me just full screen. Uh, put this in full screen mode. Great. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be here. And let me just thank Isabel Murray House uh, for the invitation and Stuart for that introduction. So as Stuart noted, I'm just going to provide a few brief remarks. At least that was the intention before uh, we learned and could not make it. A few brief remarks on building a consensus and what that might imply on a national development plan. And I'm going to focus a lot on public infrastructure. All right. So, of course, any successful development strategy should at least have these four uh, key elements or components uh, a consensus and key projects. All right. And then I'm going to discuss briefly towards the end how we find that consensus. 
and a time path for public investment. What I mean by this is the rate at which we engage in public infrastructure development and perhaps the size of some of these projects. Of course, uh, this is pointless without a coherent uh, economic framework. I'm not, not going to say much about that in this actual presentation, but I am quite happy to have a chat about that in, in the Q&A. And of course, a political settlement is fundamental to whatever I say tonight and whatever we do uh, moving forward in, in Guyana. I'm going to say a few words perhaps at the end on what that might look like or what that means. All right, so I'm going to start with what we know and what I'm about to say here are based on recent studies published in, in 2021. I'm going to focus on, on two specific studies. The first thing I want to, to emphasize here tonight is that even well-intentioned and large public investment projects, of course, usually overwhelm uh, government's capacity. And the reasons are as follows. One, of course, when government ramps up public investment, there's an increase in demand for scarce resources, particularly skilled project managers, industry regulators, I'm thinking here uh, about the construction sector, for example, but maybe administrative staff, uh, meaning line managers in certain key ministries, public works, uh, Ministry of Finance, for example, construction equipment. Uh, think of key inputs like sand, cement, stone, right? These things perhaps uh, may seem minor, but they are fundamental to any uh, public investment project, of course, port capacity, and the list can go on. Usually what happens in countries like that, when we wrap up public investment, we usually sp spread uh, already thin, already limited planning capacity at the level of major public works, for example, or the Office of the President or the, Minister of Finance, or the Ministry of Finance, when we drive up these investment projects. Of course, I'm suggesting here, uh, without a uh, stronger case, that perhaps we need to consider the speed at which we undertake key investment projects. In the absence of that consideration, what usually happens is there's major cost overruns. This is not news for Guyana or countries like Guyana indeed, and major delays in project. You can think about the construction of the Chedijek International Report, or of course the recent road uh, on the construction. Now, recent evidence suggests, and recent, as I said, published in 2021, that there is an important U-shaped relationship between public investment as a share of GDP and project unit costs. Now, by U-shape, I mean as, as the share of investment, sorry, as the share of investment in GDP rises, you know, unit costs of a particular project might fall to some critical threshold, but beyond a threshold, uh, unit costs start to rise. And the evidence suggests, based on a panel uh, of countries, that 10% of GDP, anything beyond 10% of GDP in terms of public investment for construction, for high efficiency countries, actually unit costs start to escalate. And for countries with low uh, efficiency capacity or poor public project management capabilities, that critical threshold is about 7% of GDP. I want to be clear about what this suggests. If you're going to perhaps invest more than 7% of GDP in key infrastructure projects, costs are likely to escalate if you have limited uh, capabilities in terms of managing the project. So that's a very small number. And that's an average number based on the sample for low efficiency countries, given Guyana's small size and extreme a limitation regarding human capital. Perhaps that threshold is much lower, all right? Of course, the rationale for this U-shaped relationship between costs and public investment has to do with the size and the speed of these projects, right? Given limited resource uh, in terms of public investment governance and limited capacity for evaluation of projects, monitoring of projects. And the key point to emphasize and to think about is that we can perhaps invest a billion dollars tomorrow, but our capabilities to monitor these projects do not grow as fast, all right? Now in this environment, what usually happens is that an investment portfolio is dominated by prestige projects on, con on consideration of politics, of course. You want the shiny projects or the projects that perhaps will provide high and short-term political returns rather than economic value added. All right, so what we have here is just some illustration uh, highlighting some of the points uh, I made earlier. I wanna emphasize one point. The, the graph on the left panel shows on this axis, public investment scaling up, the rate at which we start to invest uh, in public infrastructure. And on the, on the vertical axis or the y-axis, we have project- Colin, excuse, um, we're not seeing those slides. Ah, uh, forgive me. Let me try that again. Do 
you see my screen now? Yes, sure. we're seeing the graph, yeah. Yeah, great. All right, so just to recap, so this graph is gonna show us uh, the relationship between public investment scaling up and project delay for particular investment based on a panel uh, of countries. As I said, this is a new work, 2021 publication. What this suggests here is that as we invest uh, in public infrastructure, beyond a critical threshold or a rate at which we scale up, project delay starts to accelerate. Now this should be a no brainer, all right? If we look on the right panel, there is a robust negative relationship between government effectiveness or government's ability to manage key projects and that project delay. So the more, the more capable government is, the more skilled we have in terms of monitoring and evaluation, of course, uh, fewer project delays we, we'd observe. But given Guyana's initial situation, all right, with poor government effectiveness. And that is not a critique. That is just a statement of fact in terms of a human capital constraint. We have uh, some of the, high, the highest uh, migration rate of human capital, tertiary educated students. So th this is an important fact that we, need, that we need to consider when we think about public investment scaling up. Given our limited ability to manage these projects, we should expect that we do observe in reality significant project delays, all right? So this is an important point of caution. Now, the second graph here, demonstrates the U-shaped relationship I, I mentioned earlier. Now, this left panel shows that when you observe the blue line, there is no surge in public investment. Of course, this axis shows public investment as a share of GDP, and the Y axis shows a linear prediction for cost of a project, all right? Now, the red U-shape that you observe, it captures a surge in public investment. Surge means that the investment share of GDP exceeds the previous 10-year average, right? So perhaps if you're investing, let's say on average 10% of GDP, a surge would be an investment share of 12% or 14% or 15%, et cetera. Now it is crystal clear based on this panel that the minimum threshold is about 7% or approximately 10% of GDP. Beyond that, costs start to rise. So we get cost overruns and we get significant delay in project. These are familiar observations but we need to emphasize those observations quite, quite carefully now, given the many projects on stream and the availability of financial resources. All right, so given what we know about cost of runs, given what we know about project delays, how do we, how do we buck the trend, right? How do we ensure that Diane is exceptional rather than the rule? Well, the first no-brainer usually is that we need a consensus on key projects, the reason a consensus is important is because it removes the political incentives to accelerate public investment projects. It removes the political incentives for oversized projects. Now, the second, the second reason we want to focus on a consensus is because it forces you to respect capacity constraints. And by that, I mean your limited, abil your limited ability to monitor and evaluate key public projects. If we do respect these capacity constraints, then there are less concerns about debt. Uh, because, of course, it means your rate of investment is not as fast, and your rate of borrowing debt, of course, is not as fast. Now, the second thing to consider about bucking a trend has to do with the time path for public investment, suited in Guyana's national context. Now, what do I mean by time path? I mean the time horizon. Are we going to look at 10 years to do two, three key projects? Is it 15, 20 years? Do we want to do more projects in a short horizon? Now, the time path needs to be within the context of Guyana. What do I mean by that? Well, the private sector presently would have their own investment plans in terms of business expansion. The household sector in Guyana, of course, has its own investment plans in terms of uh, house investment, all right? And these things, private sector and the household, have significant implications and demand for limited resources within Guyana. I'm talking about construction work, for example, perhaps made uh, other human capital requirements. And when government tries to invest in closing the infrastructure gap, it will exacerbate that supply constraint. So we need, to, we need to have careful planning, not just in terms of the political parties and civil society, but of course, all the stakeholders within the private sector. In the absence of considering that kind of private sector household coordination, we will have significant bottlenecks, and these have significant adverse effects, which I will emphasize in, in a few moments. When we think of time path, we also need to consider project sequence, all right? Are we going to have two projects online at the same time, or do we want to do them in stages that perhaps we do the pipeline for natural gas first rather than deep water harbor, or do we do them together? And what should be some of the criteria that we think about in making that decision? 
Well, that, that perhaps is a long laundry list, but I want to emphasize three points here tonight, and we can discuss more perhaps in the Q&A. First has to do with the size of the spillover effects. For example, if we build a deep water harbor, how would this affect growth and development or investment pro uh, prospects in other related sectors within the Georgetown and perhaps extra Georgetown area relative to if you were to build a gas pipeline, for example? So these are some of the economic considerations we need to think, think about. And we want, of course, as a matter of priority, to put those projects with the biggest spillover effects that would have significant supply chains effects, uh, stronger employment prospects, stronger growth effects, and perhaps a better profile in terms of export success. The second thing we want to think about, of course, has to do with economic returns relative to the cost. It's not always the case that you want to choose a project with the lowest cost, we should consider, but we should we look at the ratio of returns to cost. Some projects might be costly, but have really, really high returns. And that, of course, should be taken into consideration. The third, I think, is very important as it relates to short to medium term planning. Now, if you were to build a deep water harbor, for example, would this mean that Guyana would be short of uh, construction workers or plumbers, for example? We need to know that uh, because that perhaps would not be a very smart thing to build one particular project and create a significant supply bottleneck for other private sector activities or our household activities. So that's the kind of consideration that I think we need to, to keep in the back of our heads uh, when we decide uh, between or among projects. Now, I can't help but talk about politics. Uh, I think everything I discuss and we discuss tonight, politics is at the center. Now, I do want to draw your attention that consensus means political parties are going to share the credit uh, for these kind of consensus projects. I leave it to you to determine what I mean with that smiley face. I repeat, consensus means that political parties will share the credit. And I think the big question is, how do we reconcile that with the political incentives as they are presently? Now, this is not a pessimistic statement. I think this is the most important question and it should, it should really serve as, as food for thought. I repeat again, Consensus, which is what tonight is about, how do we build consensus? How do we build consensus in an environment of competitive politics or politics with such a harsh environment as is the case in Guyana? That is really the big question. All right, so bucking the trend, uh, in my view, also means knowing the difference between resource availability and resource utilization. By availability, I mean the obvious. Well. The expected windfall and the optimism means that many official lenders will become coming knocking on our doors. That could be the World Bank or other institutions. And the international private sector would do the same. I'm talking about the Barclays, Chase Manhattan, International Commercial, uh, uh, Commercial Bank. So of course, resource perhaps is, is now significantly available to Ghana. There's obviously the oil rents on the Natural Resource Fund, which George reminded us is approximately half half a billion US dollars. So resource is available. And by resource, I mean, in this case, foreign exchange, all right? Ghana is not short of Ghana currency. By resource availability, I mean foreign exchange. Green finance, which is the whole objective uh, of, low car of the low carbon development strategy, that too will relax the resource availability constraints. So that's a very good thing, what I emphasize. So Ghana now has significant resources available for use. But we need to draw an important distinction with resource availability and what I'm going to call resource utilization. And I mean the following. For in the case of labor, I mean the unemployment rate. If, the, if all Guyanese who wants to work can find the work and is gainfully and fully employed, then we don't have uh, supply capabilities in terms of labor. We're short of labor in that, in that scenario. So that's what I mean by resource utilization. In terms of natural uh, capital, I mean whether we're out of sand and stone for construction of homes, and public infrastructure. I mean, whether we have sufficient roads or electricity utility to meet the existing demand. So that's what I mean by resource utilization. And the key point here is that even a modest investment program in Guyana, given small size of the number of people who are unemployed uh, or natural capital that is available presently, even a modest investment program will quickly push us into full capacity very quickly. And that means we're going to be uh, facing some enormous supply constraints. And this is important because breaching these supply constraints produce many pathologies or adverse effects. And I want to emphasize two key uh, components of those pathologies. First, there will be a, a competitive increase in wages and rent. I mean, rental homes 
or rents for commercial properties. All right, this is bad for international competition and of course for the cost of living within the Ghana jurisdiction. One way to relax these supply constraints, of course, is to import goods. If we don't have enough cement or stone, let's import from Trinidad or the rest of the world. Sure. If we don't have enough uh, labor to build homes, then call it, we're going to get them from the Caribbean or South America. Sure. Right. Certainly that has been done uh, nine out of 10 times in the past. But I do want to emphasize that the, the evidence is clear. Uh, when we breach these supply constraints, we do observe political, socio-economic pathologies. And that's why we use terms like curse and disease when we think about or talk about uh, oil wealthy countries. Why, why should we have a political problem if we were to deal with the importation of goods and labor? Well, one has to do with the ethnic makeup of the labor we import, right? The wages they would earn in Guyana, the kind of political right particularly voting rights in Guyana. So these things open a can of worms, right? If we're gonna be thinking about important labor to, re to reduce some of the supply constraints, then we need, we need a clearly articulated immigration policy. And at the same time, we would need a clearly articulated labor policy, meaning wage compensation between a Guyanese citizen and non-citizen. And then the term, the term resident perhaps would need to be rethought. I mean, to be very careful about that because these things have significant political implications. Maybe we can't consider them or see them at this moment, but that is what uh, do, do emerge in a decade uh, uh, moving forward. The economic pathologies has to do with, well, if we start importing goods and services, if we can't produce enough chicken fast enough, all right, or enough rice fast enough, and we start importing these things, usually what happens is that we observe that we de-agriculturalize, meaning we just start importing a uh, majority of what we consume or what we could produce, right? Then we might also de-industrialize to deal with these so-called supply constraints. This is, this is uh, the consensus in the literature as it relates to breaching supply constraints in newly emerging oil economies, which is why we use terms like curse and disease, because these things happen almost as if it is a law of nature. It need not be, it need not be a law of nature, but in a few moments, I explain why perhaps we do observe these things more often than not. Now, of course, we can avoid these things if we respect the resource utilization constraint, right? What this means is that, of course, we need to close the infrastructure gap 100%. But at the same time, we also need to build and expand our capabilities to manage that process of closing the infrastructure gap. And that requires time. And that means perhaps some of this uh, newly available resources would have to be parked. You know, not necessarily a sovereign wealth fund in the traditional sense, but just perhaps for the next five years. But parking is not very sexy when we think about politics. And I emphasize again, politics is at the heart of the problem when we think about curses and diseases as it relates to oil wells. Now, a quick note on the time path in terms of closing the infrastructure gap and all the other expectations and optimism that might be associated with the oil discovery. Now, expectations may exceed the time path in fact, in fact, it is a given that expectations will exceed the time path. This is perhaps the fundamental reason why uh, most countries fail when they discover some natural resource wealth. Public servants understandably will expect a wage increase. Citizens across the breadth of Guyana would expect a rapid closure of the infrastructure gap. Think about if you're living in the hinterland, all right? What your hopes and aspirations might be with Guyana's recent discovery. Given the, uh, I don't have time to get into that in this presentation, but perhaps in the QA we could talk. Um, of course, hopefully I don't have to convince anyone here that Guyana is a highly unequal country in terms of income and wealth distribution. So there will be enormous demand, not just for wage increases, but redistributive transfers, all right? When we add politics into that mix, usually these expectations uh, inflate even further. Now the consequences, uh, of, of the badly managed expectation should be well known. I'm just going to outline a few. One is unsustainable debt. Why? Perhaps because we want to rapidly close the infrastructure gap. We want to meet our political promises of uh, wage increases, or perhaps we want to provide cash handouts to half of the country or every household, 
right? And you usually borrow to do that. Why do we borrow? Why not print money? We borrow because in the end, when, when we provide these transfers or resources, they increase import demand and we could only pay for imports with dollars. All right, if, if we don't meet these expectations, then we have voter apathy and that leads to all kinds of problems uh, in the social sector, suicide, crime perhaps, or if we do meet these expectations then we observe significant wage inflation and this can undermine competitiveness for firms within Guyana and certain for firms that export goods and services to the rest of the world. Again, if we try to close the infrastructure gap too fast, capital works will exceed uh, absorptive capacity. And of course, this leads to waste. This leads to cost overruns, delays, and of course, uh, political and economic corruption. Usually these things accompany all manner of economic crises, envy, resentment, and political crisis. Perhaps in a decade, 15 years, usually that's the time horizon when these consequences come home to roost. Of course, much of what I just said means that we need a consensus on uh, wage policy at a sectoral level uh, and certainly uh, at the national level. Just think about the recent reactions uh, on Facebook or in the press to the recent 7% wage increase. In the absence of a consensus, well, political demands and political competition, of course, will get out of hand and that takes us into the basket cases. Now, my very last slide talks briefly about what the ingredients might be in terms of building consensus. These are familiar observations, but worth emphasizing. Of course, consultation and transparency will remain important in building consensus. Think about uh, feasibility studies. Of course, this is very important when we think about uh, key, key investment projects at the level of the public sector. We absolutely need competent feasibility studies. This is a must, but public access must be guaranteed. And by public access, I mean, it should be available to the public at zero cost. We should be able to go on a website and download this rather than there being some kind of intervening force, individual or otherwise. Now, it's not enough to have public ac access and feasibility studies. We need to have robust debates about some of the assumptions in these feasibility studies, some of the projections in these fe feasibility studies. In the absence of that, I think it'd be very difficult to build a uh, consensus, not just across political parties, but certainly with civil society and other key stakeholders. Uh, competitive tendering and financing is very important. If, if we don't have transparency and accountability on that, then we have a major political problem and you know it's over. We should give up the ghost at that point. Now, location and key projects, I think is very important. Uh, the deep water harbor could be built in Burbies or the Demerara. What determines the choice? Now, of course, if we want to build consensus, that should be a technical matter. Uh, with some economic and geographical considerations perhaps, but certainly not being determined by political consideration. If we operate in that manner, I think absolutely we could build consensus, certainly at uh, the parliamentary level. We would need macro studies on all kinds of in, in, uh, uh, infrastructure projects or development initiatives on the resource utilization, meaning if we're gonna build deep water harbor, we should know what will that do for certain key uh, human capital skills or natural capital uh, resources that we have within Guyana. How might that affect economic fundamentals, debt, inflation, growth projections, not just at a national level, but perhaps regions or even at the sectoral level, the tradable sectors or the non tradable sectors? Think of import competing industries and countries and, and, and industries that just provide goods and services for the export markets. We need to have a sense, and this is a lot of work, right? We need all hands on deck in a sense, right? And this is why I think this is a tall order. And this is precisely why consensus. Uh, perhaps is not met, and we do observe basket cases more often uh, than not. I emphasize we use words like curse and disease for a reason. In the end, politics matters. There will be disagreements in Guyana, certainly with our crop of political leadership, but maybe we should just focus on the lowest common denominator. I have a question mark there because I think it's an open question what the lowest common denominator might be. Uh, I, I can't think of a strong reason I can't think of any reason why anyone would oppose the hydro project, for example. We might debate and have disagreements on certain details of the project, but I do think we have consensus on that. So maybe that's what I mean by lowest common denominator, and we should expand uh, on, on finding many more that would fit within the lowest common denominator uh, concept. 
Of course, there's the important caveat that even with consensus, the devil is in details of a specific project. And usually, uh, this, of course, I'm trying to be cute here, usually the devil is a liar. Now, this is the end of my little presentation, and I thank you for paying attention. Over to you, Stuart. Colin, thank you so much for that very punchy, very insightful presentation. Um, it was particularly interesting for me because as a practitioner in the infrastructure sector, a lot of the effects you speak about, I, I observe, you know, just in, in my, my practice. So to have that sort of economic theory behind it, it certainly gives me an understanding of why I'm seeing what I'm actually seeing as, as you know, um, as, as someone who functions in, in infrastructure. I'm sure there will be lots of questions, um, but thank you for that really, really insightful presentation. Um, okay, uh, moving right along, I'll just invite Lance, um, if you can perhaps just share your screen with us, Lance, and uh, over to you. Ah, good. Thank you, Short, and good evening, all. And let me also thank uh, Gabe and Maury House for inviting me to participate in what I believe is the beginning of a series of very interesting discussions. Um, I want to share the screen. Everyone can see this, I hope. Yes, yes, you're seeing, um, yeah. All right. Um, I always kind of smile when I hear it about consensus because certainly um, in the case of, of ICT and its potential role in Guyana, certainly there is consensus that it is critical for development. What has always been missing is the discussion about how it's going to be critical when it's going to be critical and how do we how do we get about doing it so it we've always been at the conversation stage uh ict in guyana has generally been a piecemeal exercise uh, sometimes driven by the private sector and civil society sometimes driven by government um so what i'd like to do today is is put forward some suggestions in how we can successfully integrate uh ict um, into development and, and especially now when we are about to go through really transformational uh, change and it is important that we look at how we are going to manage our resources and how as the people we're going to benefit from this transformational change going to the next slide now sorry has it frozen uh, here we go. Yeah, so as I said a few minutes ago, um, uh, ICT for utilization for, for development is, is really still in its embryonic stages across the board. Um, again, there is conversation always. Uh, it is recognized that ICT is critical, but we never really had the details going forward. Um, we also never officially looked at ICT as an economic, as a separate economic sector. Um, a lot of what you've seen is stuff that's been put together. It, it plays a part as we speak today, but I don't think at a macroeconomic level, we looked at ICT and how we could fully uh, contribute to, to the economy. Now, also for many years, we were stuck in a pattern that said that it was only after liberalization that that, they, that it was felt that ICT could fully evolve. Um, there was always a bit of pushback for that because the idea would have been, well, let's see exactly what we could do in the interim, but certainly at a, at a policy level, there was always this hope that we have to get telecom uh, liberalization done. Now, the first time this was proffered was 2001. It is now 21 years later and it's only been I say about three to four, probably five months ago, when uh, full telecom liberalization uh, came into effect. So one may argue that during that period, we could have done a little more. 
and, um, and the responsibility lies with all of us um, in terms of making sure that ICT um, certainly played a, a larger role in our development evolution and, um, and, and eventual growth. So here we are in 2021, and I don't need to tell you how ICT is, is uh, depending on perspective, it's uh, pervasive, it's intrusive, it's, it's all encompassing, but certainly it, it is that critical everyday component in our daily lives. There is no question that it is a, it is a leading, if not the leading 21st century economic sector. All of that, I may argue, or submit to you, then makes it perfect for supporting uh, national development strategy and, and also the resultant implementation, just because of its size, just because of its scope, and just because of its capacity. Um, just two notes, uh, I think as, as we would agree with the role of ICT, we can certainly le leapfrog. So the legacy issues that others would have encountered while working on their national development strategy, we should not face once we go down this path like we should. It is also easier to develop a strategy now that is nimble, that is flexible, and that could easily be tinkered or filtered with as we move forward. We are, we are now in a trans transformative stage and what is going to happen is that there is going to be very gradual and sudden change as we go down this road. So there are a couple of things I think um, we have to recognize at a philosophical and, pol and policy level. We have to accept that ICT is a, is a fundamental uh, uh, cross-cutting component of all the productors in, in, in social sectors. That we can discuss in detail as, as, as we go along, but first of all, we need to understand the critical role that, that it plays in everything. And we have to go back to looking at how we could develop it as a standalone uh, economic sector in its own right, just because of the potential contribution it could make to GDP, it could make to employment, and the, also the contribution it could make to overall revenue. Notwithstanding the, um, the, the presence of oil and gas and what it can do, if we're going to talk truly about diversifying into other, into other economic sectors as a market, as a, as a function of our long-term prosperity, ICT has to become a standalone economic sector. So if we are going to go down that road, now what I normally like to do, I would pick four pillars of national development. And uh, so let's pick these four. Let's pick health, let's pick education, let's pick prosperity, and let's pick security. Now, at this age, and at this age and this stage, we are looking at national development. And when we pick the pillars, we're looking really at them being deliverables in terms of we want to be healthy, we want to be educated, we want to be prosperous, and we want to be secure. And the question would be, well, what are the mechanisms to, to use to be able to, you know, you know, to get to that stage? Now, further to that is, what it is we want to do and how does ICT play a role in making sure that these objectives are achieved or these deliverables are, 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 are achieved and, and you know, get to a point where as we move forward and we put in the mechanisms, we continue to look at the role of, of, of ICT bringing this to reality. So if we choose health, education, prosperity, then as a matter of planning, as we work out the deliverables and as we work out the goals and objectives and activities, one of the things that we should do at this point is see how ICT wraps itself around that and make sure that um, we can get to where we want to be at that stage. So here is an example of ICT as a cross-cutting component. And some of these you already know, um, I think is how we place them in the, in the various developmental uh, pillars as we plan. So electronic records for health, um, analysis and, and statistics across the board, because we need to be able to, uh, to have effective decision and policy making based on information. We have to be data driven. We look at smart, smart classrooms in terms of education. This has to do with 
how we deliver academic materials to our students. And then, of course, we have smart cities in terms of looking at the tools that, um, that can be provided for cities to perform more efficiently than they are at the moment. Now, once we go through these phases and once we sit down together and plan how all of this um, is going to be done, this has to be measured. And the way we normally do that is certainly in the IT field. When we get to the stage where we are, one of the goal that we are going to try to achieve is what is called an information society. And all that is, is a measurement of how we use the tools in our environment to make us perform better, make us learn better, make us far more healthier, and also increase our revenue, increase wealth, and, and what have you. And that is how we start measuring how successful we are going to be in terms, of, in terms of our performance and in terms of the application of the information society. We have gone further in terms of measurement. The United Nations has set up something called the World Summit on an Information Society and has set out a series of goals in terms of the things that we, that we need to do in order to qualify for the, for the term of Infinite Society. So we look at connecting villages, we look at connecting schools and universities, we look at connecting science and research institutions, libraries, archives, you know, connecting health centers. These are examples of the targets that we should look at and what we should achieve. The same thing applies, um, connecting to all local, lo all local and central government departments, uh, adapting uh, school curricula to meet the challenges of the information society, encourage the development of content, and ensure at a global level that at least half the world's inhabitants have personal use of ICT. Uh, certainly when that, standard, in our case, that could be more, but uh, well, certainly these are the sorts of targets that um, we need to look at in terms of what we are trying to achieve. This is a vision of a knowledge-based society which is competitive and giving rise to Guyana as a premier economy in the region. I come back once again to a viable technology private sector that will create revenue wealth and also contribute to the gross domestic product. These are some other goals for us to consider. The development of an ICT literate society, the full utilization of, of ICTs to promote a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship, the, the availability of ICT to all Guyanese, and this speaks about inclusiveness, to make sure that all Guyanese participate in these activities. Of course, the transformation of public business and public sectors, and also critically the implementation of modern legislation to support industry and innovation. If we are going to plan these are key areas, um, this is a summary of some of the things we just spoke about, which is strengthening the legal, regulatory, and policy environment transforming, transforming service delivery and effectiveness, access and connectivity, uh, ICT business facilitation and development. You've said this already. So these are the critical factors, which sometimes over the years have bedeviled us. Buy-in we need to be able to convince all stakeholders that this is critical for our development. It needs to be incorporated within the nationwide development strategy, fully incorporated in terms of defining clearly the role it's going to play in all the sectors and the role it's going to play by itself. Orientation and outreach, that is the education side of this because that comes back to buy-in. We have to be able to explain to the nation what it is that we're doing and the role that ICT plays in the development of Guyana. Collaboration, 
uh, that speaks for itself. Everyone has to be in the same page about this. This should go beyond speech. I think everyone is easy. It's easy for everyone to say that we believe in ICT. That's the way to go. But we have to sit down and decide that this is the best for all of us. And we need to take it forward. That leads, of course, to commitment. Because um, this is a lot of work. This comes at a price. But we have to understand that at the end of the day, it's going to benefit us all. So these are the critical factors that, um, that we should take into consideration. And it, oh, sorry, yes. I, so we have to, sorry guys, my uh, screen is freezing. Yes, yeah, so as I was saying, it is the commitment that is required at all, in all areas, whether it's public, whether it's private, what, we have to sit down and agree that this is the way we have to go and we have to begin to work together and not have this loose, not have this loose arrangement where some of us are going in one direction and some of us are going in the other. So I'll stop here, uh, Mr. Moderator, and I, I think it's, it's more important to have the, the conversation more than me talking for the rest of the evening. So if anybody has questions or comments, I'll be happy to hear them. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Lance. Um, again, a very interesting presentation. Um, what I found interesting was that, um, and I suspect this just comes from your experience of working in the Guyana space for such a long while, is, is the fact that while recognizing that ICT is, is clearly an important element in terms of national development and future economic prosperity, um, we still are not getting that consensus. And I think we perhaps can come back to that a bit in the Q&A session um, uh, with some of your perhaps specific, um, I don't know, recommendations as to perhaps how we could try and get that consensus. Because that is, I think, what has bedeviled um, various um, development plans that we've, we've had over the years. But thanks again for that, um, Lance. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to what is arguably the most interesting part of any panel discussion, and it's, it's the Q&A and the engagement with the panelists. And um, if I may, I guess moderator's um, uh, prerogative, I, I, I'd like to start with a question for both uh, Colin and Lance. Um, and, and I guess it's a, it's a very basic one. Um, I wrote an article couple of months ago for the engineers um, newsletter, Engineers Quarterly, about the need for a national infrastructure plan. And in my research, um, I kind of went back into national development plans. And there was basically, there are no less than nine development plans from independence to, to date. Um, I don't think any of them was actually implemented um, in any meaningful way or in, in, in their entirety. Many of them were restricted to political cycles. So uh, the first question to, to Colin is, is, is this. Um, a skeptic may ask, fine, we've, we've been independent for 56 years. We've not really had any sort of national development plan, which was implemented beyond the political cycle. Um, do we need a national development plan? Um, We've, we've got to where we are. The country clearly has developed since 1966. Um, so I just want to get from, from both panelists, starting with perhaps Colin, uh, what's the current economic theory behind development planning? Is, is this something which is still favored? Is, is it an outdated concept? What's, what's the current thinking in, in economic planning about national development plans? No, well, I, I think the answer is clear in terms of economics. Yes, you should be planning, right? Uh, so that you could minimize transaction costs, economic costs, et cetera. But I don't think economics is very useful to answer your question. The political economy literature would say that political business cycles are a reality and you should try to plan around that, right? We can't, we can't wish the world doesn't exist. The world exists. Politics matters in Guyana and uh, political parties want to take credit for key projects. They want their supporters to benefit disproportionately, right? They might even want to determine who gets the project. And these are realities and constraints and we would have to uh, readjust, modify, 
our expectations. This is just the reality. I mean, this is when you when you look at countries that are successful in terms of growth and development. It's in terms of politics. It's very messy. There's nothing uh, politically correct about the rise of East Asia or old Europe or the United States. Nothing politically correct there. Right? I know that's not what perhaps you want to hear, Stuart, but you know, we, we have to break some eggs to, to, to get messy. We hope, of course, uh, to, to do better than the past, but I don't see how we could ignore political business cycles. Of course, we can come to, you, you made a great point earlier that, and I read your article. Yeah, we have lots of plans, but didn't change anything at all. Perhaps because we missed the elephant in the room, and that is the political business cycle. We should take that as given and try to work around that. Excellent. Lance, any um, contribution, particularly given the fact that you worked on the national development strategy? Um, any insight from or lessons learned from that experience? Um, anything you want to share with us? Well, Colin's point about political uh, business cycles or political cycles in general are important. Um, but there's also, I think there's some philosophy behind this because Every once in a while, you get the idea that ICT, you, you know, should be uh, ubiquitous. It, it, it's, it's just there. It's simple, you know, the way you put on the tap and the way, you, the way you find a hammer and nail and do what you need to do and stuff like that. And that's a nice place to be. And that works in some of your more large and mature, uh, mature environments. Um, I think certainly for now, there needs to be a framework under which we're going to operate. Um, especially with the challenges that we face. Uh, we do a lot of work, for example, in, 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 in the hinterland and in the interior and stuff like that. And when you look at what obtains in Georgetown versus what happens out there, just in connectivity alone, uh, just in the delivery of services, I mean, it's, it's, it's like chalk. I don't need to tell most of you, but there's like chalk and cheese. Now, if, if, if you leave that to be ubiquitous and if you leave that to be to come along by itself. What tends to happen is that these services are going to remain on the coast and what's not going to happen is that it's gonna take a while for it to get into the interior and into the rural areas. So certainly in Guyana at this stage in terms of where we are, there needs to be, there needs to be a, an implementation framework. There needs to be a development framework in terms of how this is going to work. Um, the, the, the important is everyone has to participate in that. They, they, they've got to be able to, everyone has got to believe, um, civil society, private sector, public sector, they've got to believe that this is the way to go. And they've got to agree that this is the way that that is going to happen. Who is going to be the driver for that? Who is going to set up the, um, who is going to prepare the wicket for the want of a, a nice turn for it to go forward? We're going to have to work that out. But certainly we need something to guide us going forward at this point. Okay, seems to be consensus that there is a case to be made for um, some sort of a national uh, development plan. Uh, thank you both. Um, right, so in terms, of, in terms of the mechanics, you can either uh, post your, your question in the chat or you can raise, um, raise your hand. And I think we have two hands that are currently raised and I'll go to Mr. Frederick Collins first. Mr. Collins. Thank you, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, all. Um, the presentations certainly uh, have covered a wide area, and they raise so many questions that it's hard for me to obey Isabel's instructions and confine myself <laughs> to the briefest possible, but I'll try. I have one question uh, for each uh, panelist. Mr. Hines um, said, he touched upon consensus, and so did Mr. Constantine. And, um, that is so important. But he also touched on um, the law. He said that there will be need, Mr. Hines, that is strengthening the legal, regulatory, and policy environment. And I looked at a, 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 a letter from my predecessor, Troy Thomas, explaining what the legal action had achieved in bringing um, the period down for to five years for Exxon. And it said, this gives the Guyanese people the opportunity to assess this, that, and the other. Now that is a year ago, and we now know 
that the opportunity has made, it has made no difference. Why? Because Exxon does precisely what it likes. And Exxon is not the only one doing precisely what it likes. We have government officials doing exactly what they like. So the question is, what is the point of strengthening legal, regulatory, and policy environment if people are simply going to disobey the law? That, that is a, don't you see that as a serious problem? That is number one. And the, probably the question I have for uh, Mr. Constantine, he said something interesting. He said the, uh, he hopes he agrees that the hydro project is a no brainer. Well, I don't think I have much brains because I don't necessarily agree that it is a no brainer. Um, in fact, I see my uh, friend, um, uh, Alfred there, I'm sure he's going to raise it, but uh, he, what about, what about the cost? When I, when I saw the Chinese form had been um, selected, apart from who, who, who the form is, when I saw that the model had changed, that we were simply going to buy the electricity, so we weren't going to get into involved with all of this confusion with fit motival stories and so on. I said, that is great. And then I saw Alfred's letter, where he was saying that the cost at which it was going to be delivered um, among other things um, to the target was going to be in excess of what we can produce on an individual basis with, with, with uh, and I, I, I'm sure he meant it, he didn't say it, simple technology, um, which is going to be able to be within our control instead of a, a, a monstrous thing outside of it. Um, so what about that? And what about the other variables, like for example, the um, uh, areas where uh, the, 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 the Vietnam River, if I, the Mekong River, drying up so that where, where you have all these um, uh, hydro um, uh, uh, dams in, in China, what about how the, 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 um, the weather is changing and presenting a risk like in the Guri Dam in Venezuela? How is it such a no-brainer? Thanks, those are my questions. Yeah, uh, sure, do you mind if I go first? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Fred, great, great questions. I thought I'm going to start with your, with your last question, comments at the end about the law enforcement. Um, when I say no brainer, I mean uh, a hydro power plant should be a no brainer. You, I completely agree that uh, the specifics of the project, you have much disagreement, and that's very much what I said at the very end. But the devil is in the details of the project, and that's why we can't have consensus actually. So I repeat, when I say no brainer, I mean the idea of having a hydro. Uh, project should be a no-brainer. The big issue is the specifics of these projects. So completely agree. The point about the drought, I think, is fundamental. Uh, same issue uh, in, 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 in Ghana. Hopefully, hopefully, if we have uh, effective planning, we could have some sequencing, meaning, okay, so we have some drought periods, but perhaps other sources from wind, perhaps other sources from solar. We need, we need to think through the whole system, right? So it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be focused on a single, on a single uh, non-renewable renewable source. I think I think your comment on law enforcement is fundamental, right? Uh, and perhaps this should be emphasized here now, and I want to do it, that when we think about recommendations, we need to be thinking about enforcement. There's no point, or there's little point in trying to put things in the books if they're not enforced. Enforcement is fundamental, right? And I think it perhaps demonstrates how we think about uh, uh, how change takes place in Guyana. Perhaps we think if laws are in the books, then that would change Guyana. But if that's what you think, we, we need to rethink the whole analytical frame. What I want to mention here briefly, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Lance speak, is that economic analysis is very important. Of course, all the technical stuff very important. But in terms of change, changing policy, we need to have political analysis. All right, we need to start thinking about how do we organize interest groups that matter for these political parties and organize these interest groups along, along certain economic issues, for example. If we don't think along those lines, change will not come because you're right, Fred, there's no point to the law if it's not enforced. Thanks. Lance? I wanna respond by first telling two very brief stories. Mashrimani designers complain in several instances that when they take, you, you have to send your proposal into the ministry in order to be considered um, for, their, for your costume to be used for the band and so on. And for some bands, it's quite 
is quite lucrative. And one of the things that some of them complain about is that they submit their ideas to a particular agency. They don't get awarded the contract. Yet on the day of Mashramani, they see their costume in the road. And while I understand the difficulties that Fred is, 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 uh, is talking about, when I talk about modern legislation, I want to be able to protect that Mashramani designer in the first instance. And yes, we may have difficulty with enforcement, but let us continue to put, as much as possible, let us continue to put the laws in the books. Let us modernize intellectual property. I'll tell you a more serious story. Many years ago, there was a, a cluster group out of Guyana, one in Jamaica, one in Canada, and one in Australia. And we were going to work on a joint animation project, extremely lucrative. I think we signed up all the contracts, got the lawyers in the room and did everything we needed to do. And then Australia raised, raised an objection. So but there's a problem. What's the problem? Australia says to us that they are getting funded from the government and they are not going to partner with entities in a country that don't have modern intellectual property legislation. I make that point to say to you that this is going to become economic, more and more economic after that, where you're running into this issue, especially when you're doing, when you're doing or looking at the possibility of doing work that has intellectual asset implications, countries are hesitating to deal with you because they do not believe you have the environment to protect their intellectual assets so that uh, should that become an issue. So, I understand the challenge, I understand the difficulties, but I think we should continue to as much as possible ask and, and, and advocate and lobby for putting in the legislation that is required for this country to go forward. Because right now it might not look like it's, it's, um, it's, it's that much of an issue, but we're gonna get there soon enough. And we're gonna get there soon enough because as we become an oil and gas uh, economy. And as we, as more revenues come in, as more investments come in, the demand is going to be that we deal with it. It's happening already. So uh, this is gonna be out of our control after time because for, for the condition of the investment, for the condition of the collaboration, they are going to, they're going to start to ask, why aren't these things in place? might not be critical now, but pretty soon as you continue to go down the path you're going down, it's going to happen. So as I said before, I understand the challenge, I understand the difficulties, but we got to continue to put that, um, put that legislation in there as much as we can. Excellent. Great responses. Thank you. Um, I see Mr. Trotz, Mr. Elric Trotz has his hand up and uh, he had for some time, please. Hi, Stuart. You hearing? Yes. You hearing me? Yes. Yeah, Hi, hello everybody. Just uh, another question, uh, uh, a couple of observations, you might call them musings of a senior citizen. Uh, the whole question of, uh, I think at this point, we have the basis for definition of a national development plan, which would inform action in Guyana, particularly over the next few years, the next decade. And I'm putting this under the perspective of the climate change umbrella. And this brings me to the LCDS. Uh, that is going to inform two activities, how we move to decarbonize the economy. And the other one, much more important, which I don't think is getting the emphasis that it needs to get, is how we start to build climate resilience. Uh, across all sectors, how we deal with our, uh, our drainage problems, how we deal with the fact that we're below sea level. Uh, that has to have equal emphasis. Uh, the government has put out an LCDS and they have asked for comment, uh, public comment, and they, uh, I think it's encouraging that they signify that they would have public consultation. Uh, but I hope that that consultation is really uh, a genuine consultation, because as Colin said, the whole question of consensus is very important. It's not only consensus at the stage of uh, determining what actions you're going to take, but it's consensus in the way it's implemented. 
uh, and consensus in uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation, the whole range from product uh, project conception to project uh, implement implementation. So that's an opportunity. At the moment, uh, consensus terms like consensus and inclusionary seems to be like a pipe dream, given the socio-political context in Guyana. Uh, and I would hope that the LCDS at this stage, even though, even though uh, it has started to be implemented uh, without full, uh, full consensus, uh, look at the Amila uh, Falls project. So we, we have the platform for that. And I would hope that, uh, you know, it's a genuine consultation and that this might move us to a different uh, uh, modus operandi in Guyana. And one final uh, point about national development plans. Uh, last years ago, I had to write a, a science policy uh, for Guyana. And I struggled to do it. And when I presented it to my minister, who was no other than Haslin Paris, uh, I said, Haslin, you know, it would have been so much easier for me to write this if we had a national development plan. Haslin looked at me, lit a cigarette, blew a cloud of smoke, and says, don't you know, now not having a plan is a plan. And I said, what craziness is this? Until a few years later, I bumped into the chaos theory. And I realized that Hazen was way ahead of me in, in terms of some of these new concepts. But I think that the LCDS puts some definition to where we need to go and how quickly we need to get there. And it's an opportunity for us to put a lot of these things in, in place. And thanks uh, for the presentation. I'm glad to see that GAP is becoming a bit more visible in these conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trotz. Um, can I turn the table and put a question to you? If you had to perhaps advise the LCDS Secretariat as to how they should go about perhaps having meaningful consultation, what are some of the things you would you would um, you'd probably advise them to do? Well, to have the consultations with all the critical stakeholders, but the LCDS is not the, yes, that's the, 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 that's the framework. What is going to be important is how do you roll it out? What are the actions that you need to take? What are the priorities? Uh, how basically they are going to be uh, implemented? You need a detailed, uh, a program, the, the whole question, for instance, for uh, you would expect that it would uh, look at options, cost benefit analysis, and you'll have that transparency. So that at the end of the day, people on the whole feel some ownership for the activities that are taking place. And it's not uh, an elite basically or making the decisions of what is best or what, there must be some way at which we can achieve the type of consensus and inclusion that Colin was speaking about. But uh, as I say, uh, we, we need to, yes, the LCDS as a policy document is okay, but the critical activities are going to be where we look at how it's implemented prioritization, which projects, why, costs, et cetera. All that information should be public information. Great, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, while we're on Zoom, we are also uh, live streaming on Facebook. And I think there's a question which, which came in on Facebook. And it's basically, I'll read it out. It has been said that a failure to plan is a plan to fail. But the panelists have hinted that there may be certain prerequisites that have to be addressed before we can have a plan that fits national consensus. What are some of the things the panelists see that we need to address before we can indeed reach the consensus to move forward? Lance, Colin. 
Could you go that again? Sorry, I think I missed that. Forgive me. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll try and read a bit um, more slowly. It has been said that a failure to plan is a plan to fail. But the panelists have hinted that there may be certain prerequisites that have to be addressed before we can have a plan that fits national consensus. What are some things the panelists see that we need to address before we can indeed reach the consensus to move forward? All right, so in my presentation, I, I talked about transparency and, and having robust debates and public access to, to feasibility studies, for example, and perhaps we could add political maturity. I mean, I, I, think, I think it's clear what, what might be the key ingredients to consensus, but none of that will happen really unless uh, political parties and, and the political class generally uh, have the incentives to do that, right? I mean, it, it's telling that we are here discussing how the political leadership can pay attention to us. That's basically what we're discussing here. And the reason we're discussing that is because voting doesn't matter for politics then. That's, that's, that's basically what, what we're getting at here. If we had a political system that responds to voter preference, there would be need, no need for us to debate whether or not we need a national plan. We would demand it and political uh, levers would move to produce that. So I think the fundamental thing then that we need to provide for consensus is a change in the political structure and the political incentives. I'm afraid that unless, unless we have uh, a, new, a new way uh, to organize politics and how we organize voting, then there will be no incentive for the political class to pay attention. Right? There might be a plan, I want to be clear here. I, I don't want anyone to think that there is no plan. There might be a plan, but we might not be a part of it. We may not be at the table when these plans are set. There might very well be a national development plan. Written down, printed too in a document, but not, not for our consideration. We must, we, must, we must think about that, right? And, that's, and that will continue if the vote is predetermined in the next election. And based on historical pattern in Guyana, it is. It is absolutely predetermined. And if it's predetermined, why bother with genuine consultations? Right. So I could I could list all, all the things we need to do to build consensus, right? We need to be transparent, we need to be clear, we need to be honest, obviously. But unless we deal with the fundamental political incentives, none of that will be born to life, I'm afraid. I'm finished, sure. That was that was no, the end. No, no, no. Uh, sobering. <laughs> Um, Lance? Unfortunately, one of the things, one of the things is always happening in Guyana is that we go to election, we vote for someone, then we generally go back to doing, a, you know, we go back to our daily lives and mind our own business, except for the few who will continue to agitate and protest and so on. One of the things that we also do as a civil society in the private sector is that we always get up and complain and point about well, why isn't the government doing X and why isn't the government doing Y? And why isn't the government doing X? And the only time that we really participate is when a, a document is introduced and then from there we begin to, 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 um, to do it. I think one of the things that we're going to have to do is that we're going to have to publish our own ideas. Uh, we're going to have to, we're going to have to publish our own philosophy and some of the so, you know, what is it that the non-government actors would like to see Guyana become um, from, a, from a developmental perspective, from a socioeconomic perspective and do that? There's got to be ideas coming from somewhere else. One of the things I always quarrel about, in, even in my sector sometimes, I've always said for some of the guys, especially some of the younger ones, is that you got to put stuff out there as well in terms of what you want. And, and, and we, it, I think if you continue to go through this cycle of having to wait to see what policies come out, and then they don't come out the way you like it, and then you record that you don't like it, and then at the end of the day, you may or may not be um, listened to in, uh, in, in terms of those ideas. There's got to be, this has got to become a society of competing ideas. You got to be able to, whether it's GAPE or whether it's a chamber or whether it's a thing, uh, any one of us in my sector, you know, you know, Colin, anybody else, Fred, you know, Fred, you got to be able to put stuff out there uh, for, for public comment and public debate. There's got to be, to me, that high-level discussion 
outside, uh, uh, sometimes outside of the government sphere. You got to be able to put those ideas out yourself. If we continue to wait until the policy comes from the government side, you may, uh, you may be satisfied or you may not be satisfied with what you get. We got to get to, uh, I don't want to use the word, it's old, but we got to get to think tanks and stuff like that. So you got to have somewhere there, we got to be pushing out their ideas out there and having discussions about things. And then, you know, at fall, you know, you may come to a consensus around that and you may be able to go to your government stakeholder and say, well, listen, these are the 20 bright ideas that we have. Um, look at them and let's see, you know, we like them. Let's see what your thoughts are. Then we can have a debate in terms of whether they like it or not. But I, I don't believe we're gonna get much further if if we if we come to if we come to even events such as these where we come and 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 we have these discussions if we would like to see some semblance of a national plan therefore i think we should be contributing to some of the uh, you know the 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 uh, contributing some of those pieces without before getting invited to so we we should have an idea what this funding should look like in a structured way, you know, a series of ideas floating around in terms of where I think we're going. I could be wrong and completely off the mark, but at least I put it forward and have it there for conversation. Thanks. All right. Um, I'm cognizant of the time. I will just go to a few questions in the chat. Uh, this one is from, I think, Dr. Terrence Blackman to everyone. There needs to be broad social agreement on the approximate terms of where we might be headed as a nation if we are to be successful in following the pathways prescribed by any national development plan. What needs to change in order to drive that consensus? Similar to the previous question. What should it change to and how do we cause this change? Any thoughts? But you kind of, similar to the previous question. I, I, I suppose I can, I can briefly repeat uh, or summarize what I said before. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, much of what I said applies. And what I would say, Terence, is that, you know, we can't even agree on the political rules, you know, um, which is the, the foundation of, of any society. At the, very, at, at, at the very basic level, we must uh, present and form a government. And we can't agree for, for, for however long, we can't agree on, on basic uh, political procedure. So that's telling in terms of whether or not we can find consensus on, on big, pro big projects and, and, and these other things. Um, in terms of what we need to do to, to force change, the people of Guyana need to make it costly for any government to continue to operate this way. In this sense, economics is useful. I repeat, the people of Guyana need to make it costly. And by cost, the, the source of the cost could be economics or other means. They need to make it costly for any government to continue to operate in this way. That is the first thing we need to do to change. Uh, I, I agree with Fred. Uh, we need to present competing ideas. Um, that, is, that is very important, but there must be incentive to, to, to change. The apartheid regime in South Africa uh, ended because it became costly to continue its operation. Slavery ended because it became costly to continue that system. We can absolutely have a different Guyana tomorrow if the cost is too high of maintaining the current system. That's what I would say. All right, thank you. Um, not to discriminate, there is a question here on this coming rainy season. will be very telling as to how prepared we are or we need to be in the short term to prepare for impending change coming during the decade. How quickly can we alter course and relocate the population that will be most affected by the new level of flooding? I don't know, there are some environmentalists out there and not necessarily wanting to call them out. I, but I see Dr. Volcan or maybe even Dr. Trotz. Uh, any ideas on this? You know, uh, I, I recall, if I may, Stuart. Um, hello? 
Yeah, I, I, I recall, I can't recall the name now, but I'm sure we can find the, the record. I do remember that um, under the Barnum administration, uh, there was a study commission to, to look at if we could relocate the city where it would be. And if my memory serves me right, it's somewhere in region seven, you know, um, based on, on certain geographical, the, the river and the, the whole the whole nine, right? And I do think it's a good question, and, and Ulrich mentioned some of this point earlier about, about the sea level. I mean, we do need to seriously consider the idea that perhaps we need to move from the coast, right? And of course, that's perhaps 50 years, hopefully not, not sooner than that, 50 years, 100 years from now. But that, and if we're going to do that 50, 100 years from now, we need to start thinking and taking steps today. We can't wait 150 years from now to, to be doing that. I, I do think that is not a small matter. That's not being cute. That is about survival. I mean, islands are flooding, right? Uh, I'm going to end it there. I think Ulrich wants to make a comment. Sure. Dr. Roth? Yeah. Yes, Jota. This, you know, is the way was the premise of my first intervention. Uh, as Guyanese, we have to pay attention to our vulnerability to climate change. Uh, we are already living in a world where climate is changing and we've seen the impacts. And the projections are that if we are in a business as usual scenario, there was a recent article where Guyana was highlighted. By 2030, Georgetown will be underwater as a result of the scenarios coming up from sea level rise. So uh, the, 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 I think we, we, we really need to build some consensus around the need to address our vulnerability and to shape our development to build that resilience to present and to future climate. And the question of moving the capital is, is an option. And I think that the IDB had done some studies uh, some years ago where actually I know with uh, the, the old uh, PNC government, they were thinking of moving into the far interior. But I think the IDB study located uh, away someplace in the Parika, in the Parika area, where Stanley Ming is basically doing his development. And it was also an area that was uh, Earmark for the deep water harbor, the Lanabali deep deep water harbor. But these are sorts of things that we need to be addressing. Uh, the safety and viability of Guyanese population in the face of a challenging climate. And as, as I say, we have the we have the LCDS, which could form the platform in which we start to build the consensus and the inclusionary uh, sort of uh, uh, approach to things that we need to. Uh, I, I didn't want to blow that trumpet too loudly because you know I'm so involved in climate change, but the climate change issue, as you see from the Glasgow meeting, it's imperative that we focus on, well, of course, for global good decarbonizing the economy, but more importantly, building uh, a Guyana that can function in the climate that we are anticipating. That should inform a lot of our activities and the way how we evolve our future development. Excellent, thank you. Well, Isabel has pretty much given me my two minute warning, but, but before we leave, I'll just ask, I think um, Professor Mandel has uh, some contribution he'd like to, to make. Um, uh, uh, thank you. Um, I just want to make two brief points. One, I think that trumpet should be very loud and clear. Um, the need for consideration of relocation, of at least a part of the coastal population, I think is urgent. Several years ago, I gave a presentation um, on the uh, Clive Thomas annual presentation, and I talked extensively about that. There's quite a bit of work that has been done on, on actually the relocation. But on another point, I would just want to identify that uh, there's an irony in Isabel having uh, organized a session like this, 
because much of the com conversation that has gone on in the last couple of minutes is about the need for civil society in the in the region generally and in Guyana in particular to formulate um, alternative views of how the society can proceed and how um, in the absence of consensus, consensus can be formed because in the history of the region, the New World Group, in which the, the Carey's name is very prominent, um, filled precisely that role. Um, it had its heyday in the late 60s and the early 70s broke apart for various political reasons. But it was a very valuable contribution that was made. And I think that um, it, it may be that it is only in civil society and the development of new ideas about the direction of the society that the consensus that you all are talking about can be formulated. Um, I don't mean to be excessively pessimistic, but I doubt that as the political situation is currently configured, it will be reasonable to expect such a consensus to emerge. Um, and so the idea of, I think Lance's idea, that it's the responsibility of uh, intellectuals, and you know, I count myself as an outsider intellectual interested in Guyanese development, I think it's the responsibility of intellectuals to form a vehicle of a, a vehicle by which um, new ideas can be formed to provide the intellectual basis for the emergence of a new consensus. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that's the central ethos of Maury House and uh, these presentations. It's sort of baby steps and shipping away, um, certainly with that objective in mind. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're pretty much coming to the to the close, and um, I would just like to ask our two panelists if they have any closing remarks before I hand it back to Isabel um, to 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 do the vote of thanks. Uh, yes, um, I would like to echo what Jay just said that um, the intellectual class, but I would say uh, the, the Guyanese population at large, uh, we do have a responsibility. To, to think critically, to, to raise our voices and to put our shoulders to the wheel, as it were, uh, at this critical juncture in, in, in Guyana development. And the absence of that kind of engagement, bold engagement, well, Guyana will be no different from the basket cases that we read about in, in the textbooks. And it really is up to us. Change is absolutely possible. It is not easy, but it requires critical thinking and bold engagement. Thanks. Lance? Yeah, let me echo a lot of that, that Colin said. Um, I think we are at the crossroads in a moment. Uh, now is when we're going to have to make, the, make those decisions in terms of where we go next. And I, I don't know if we have the luxury of waiting until this, this comes from the official policy making and stuff like that. I reiterate again that we, we're going to have to begin to put the ideas out down based on study, based on research, be able to establish positions. You're not being harmful, you're not being, you're not being political, you're just, you know, you're, you're simply putting out ideas in terms of where you think this in the various sectors are, you know, or across the framework, you know, where we're heading. And um, we're just going to have to start doing that. So uh, hopefully from here, uh, Mori House has always been a place for discussion and Mori House has always been a place for sharing of ideas. So uh, Ernest & Young is a, is, a, is, a, is a consulting company and they have a saying called from thought to finish. So I would submit to you that there is plenty of thought. Finish comes next. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for a very interesting and stimulating discussion. Um, I think we've clearly established that there is need for a national development plan. I think we've sort of interrogated some of the bits that should be in there. Um, but it's, it's just the age old question of how do we then move forward and get that consensus. And we have to keep trying to achieve that. Um, I think we have some interesting thoughts and suggestions as to the role and the responsibility indeed that, that we as civil society 
um, play, and perhaps uh, we need to be a bit more proactive. Um, but but yeah, we're certainly at a critical juncture, and we we must uh, pick up the mantle and um, and uh, in moving forward. So I would just like to thank you, and I will hand it back to Isabel now to uh, make the final uh, closing uh, remark. So warm thanks to Stuart um, for moderating and to Colin and Lance for their contributions. Um, and also to our audience as always for their questions and comments. For those who joined late, um, our regrets, uh, Dr. Pereira, Anna Pereira was taken ill and was therefore unable to participate in this, uh, in this panel this evening. Hopefully she'll join us uh, on another occasion. Um, as ever, it's, it's been very stimulating, very interesting. Um, and uh, onwards to the next one. Um, I was quite amused to hear the discussion uh, that seemed to be rekindling uh, the previous panel's um, debate about the energy mix and the uh, merits of the the various different uh, alternatives. Um, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. Some discussions are circular um, and we sometimes do need to go back and visit points that um, we think we've covered before. Uh, I th I'd like to pick up on um, Professor Mandel's point uh, and uh, I think um, Dr. Trotz touched on it as well, which is that we do have a, there is a, it is important to discuss, but um, the, you know, climate change isn't going to wait for us um, to reach consensus. Um, and if we are looking at a capital city that is uh, likely to become uh, uninhabitable, at least in part, in the next um, 15 or 20 years, we maybe also do need to think very carefully about the amount of capital we are sinking into, no pun intended, but into infrastructure there right now, and whether that might not be better, you know, better served, um, uh, distributed elsewhere in the country, for example. So there's a lot, to, a lot to talk about, a lot to consider. It's been very stimulating. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon or enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, we look forward to seeing some of you the next time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. To Thank the you, panel. everyone. Good night. Thank you.